Okay. All right, so uh, I guess sort of I'm here to talk about the past 20 years <laughs> instead of sort of looking forward, talking about what has happened over the past 20 years. And when I had a look at the, uh, at the speakers list for tonight, I realized that one of my fellow colleagues from our School of Journalism in Cologne, uh, Jochen Wigner, will be one of the um, later speakers tonight. And uh, in fact, so uh, the question is what has changed over the past 20 years? And I would say basically everything. And uh, so Jochen and I, we started 25 years ago in Cologne at the School of Journalism. And uh, we in fact sat next to each other for many years because at that time, um, we were seated in alphabetic order according to our last name. And my maiden name was Vetwa, and so Jochen Wegner and Brigitte Vetwa were seated next to each other. So I think this is a sort of just an illustration of what has changed over the past 25 years, because that wouldn't be possible today anymore, I Thank guess. Um, but that's not sort of all that has changed over the past 20 years. Both of us has, have started in uh, traditional media. And when we started our education in Cologne, um, I was thinking back and realized that uh, sort of I was writing my first articles uh, on an electric typewriter um, when I started my education, which at least had sort of one electronic line where you could correct sort of the last line that you've been typing. So many things have changed uh, since then, and um, I would like sort of to, to take a look backwards at the beginning and then see sort of how we had to adapt over the past 25 years, um, because I believe many of you haven't been, either haven't been born or, ha or have been in kindergarten when we made that experience. Um, so it sounds like if we were dinosaurs, it in fact doesn't feel like it all that much. Um, but the world has changed significantly. When we started, um, there were sort of 27 million papers sold in Germany every year. And if we have a look at that today, um, it's, uh, it has dropped to 16 million papers that, uh, that are sold in Germany today. Or if we have a look at another number, Frankfurter Allgemeine Zeitung, which used to be sort of the dominant paper in Germany and still has a reputation, had 400,000 sold uh, papers every day, and today it has 260,000 um, sold uh, papers every day. 20 years ago, 7 million Germans were watching sort of the evening news Tagesschau every day, and today it's less than half of that. It's, it's uh, let me look, 3.2 million people who watch Tagesschau every day. Um, when we started our education, there was basically no mobile network. Uh, D1 and D2 uh, at that time started in 1992, and E plus started in 1994. So 20 years ago, in 1995, about less than 10 million Germans had a mobile phone. Today, we have 112 million mobile phones and phones in Germany more than we have inhabitants. And in fact, Germany is better in that respect than the United States, which one wouldn't think. Um, and in terms of internet access, of course, 20 years ago, 1.8% um, of the German population had an internet access. And today, it's 84%, which is due to the fact that we have quite an, an old population. So wh what does that mean? It means that the way people consume information has changed dramatically over the past 20 years. And Jochen and I, we've been working for more than 20 years now. And uh, sort of during that time, s the way the media has been working had to change. Because when we started our jobs, Jochen sta started with Focus, and I started with Wirtschaftswoche. So very, at that time, profitable, stable German magazines sort of were doing very well. In fact, Wirtschaftswoche was one of the cash cows of the Verlagsgruppe Handelsblatt. Um, also, that has changed significantly ever since. But at that time, we were benefiting uh, from sort of the first internet bubble in Germany. And at that time, if you were a startup and you wanted your brand name to become recognized and you were looking at an IPO and you wanted people to in fact get interested to invest into your company, 
what you would do is you would have to pay for printed ads in business magazines like Wirtschaftswoche, Handelsblatt, FAZ, and you had to pay a lot of money for that. So at that time, um, around 2000, sort of, it was a great place to work uh, if you were in one of those business papers. And uh, sort of the the the, um, uh, uh, the returns were exploding. We have uh, sort of the Verlagsgruppe Handelsblatt at that time made double-digit returns, and then the bubble burst, and sort of things turned uh, quite to the worse. Um, but sort of sl briefly before that, people even thought sort of that you could start new printed magazines and papers in Germany. The Financial Times Deutschland uh, was founded in 2000 by Pearson and Gruner and Ja. And they were doing that because they thought you could make money with it in Germany, uh, which obviously they were proven wrong. <laughs> so what does that mean? Um, how th the big question um, for all papers and magazines, for everyone in the media who s sort of used to produce educated content, uh, uh, content that was, uh, that, would that would talk about an, ev an ever more complex world, had a sort of, now people have to think, how do we make money with it? And how do we get paid for the content that we produce? It was a no-brainer when we started working in the media industry. And today, sort of, it has proven to be one of the biggest challenges. Um, so what has happened since then? Financial Times Deutschland um, closed down in 2012. Frankfurter Rundschau, 2013. Mainzer Zeitung also 2013. What has happened? Axel Springer, at that uh, time sort of one of the large publishing groups in the print sector, sold the, all their regional uh, uh, newspapers to another group um, who had nothing better to do than closing some of the regional editions of those papers shortly after. Um, on the other hand, sort of Springer has been investing heavily into the digital world, same as too for Boda, who just sort of acquired Xing, uh, the majority of Xing in 2012. And everyone's basically hoping that they will be able to um, make lots of, uh, sort of at least a part of their revenues from the digital world sometime soon. Um, by now, 106 German papers have a paywall. Uh, among those built or uh, Süddeutsche Zeitung, whom we will learn about uh, later on. What has changed? Huffington Post has come to Germany. Papers like Die Welt, Welt am Sonntag, Welt Online, N24 have sort of a joint newsroom. You have a separation of content and channels. And even Xing has started, just started sort of their new business edition, which I believe many of you will probably receive in the morning. And they have very high profile people who have been joining those uh, editing board. I mean, um, Roland Tichy used to be editor in chief, chief of uh, Wirtschaftswoche. He's now heading sort of the editorial board of, uh, of Xing. Um, or Spiegel Online has started their new digital offering, Bento. Um, so what, y what does that show? It shows that many things have been cha changing, sort of people don't read papers anymore, um, but they read different things. And if you have a look at, at sort of the outside world, if you have a look at New York uh, or the United States, over there sort of papers and magazines have had an even more difficult stand. I mean, when I grew up, Newsweek was a household name. Newsweek doesn't exist anymore. Um, or the Boston Globe. I used to spend um, two years in Boston as a correspondent for Wirtschaftswoche. Boston Globe was a huge daily paper, and it doesn't exist. Uh, sort of, it still exists, but it used to be sold to uh, Times for 1.1 billion U.S. dollars 20 years ago, and uh, sort of in 2013 it was sold for 70 million to John Henry. So quite a change in terms of valuation. Financial Times is not any more British. It has been sold to a Japanese group, uh, Nikkei, for 1.2 billion euros. And Business Insider has been bought by Springer. So lots of M&A activity uh, within the media sector. Everyone is trying to adapt the business model and see where is a space where we can pay, make money with content. Um, so, f 
following this, the advertisement, uh, the, um, the amount of money that, pr uh, that editing houses make with advertisements has gone down. So the good times that I've still seen at Wirtschaftswoche uh, has significantly changed, and particularly in the space of uh, ads for jobs and ads for, ads for uh, real estate. And at the same time, sort of uh, those those revenues in, in uh, for printing uh, places have gone down in du with double digit numbers. But at the same time, companies like Scout Twenty Four have huge valuations on the stock market. So, what does that mean for journalism? What does that mean for the other uh, for 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 the rest of of the world? How do we consume? information. I think sort of, um, I've been looking at this from the media side for 12 years personally, mm -hmm. and uh, in 2007, when there was no change in sight, I decided sort of uh, there would be a very, that sort of the uh, publishing groups would have a very difficult time to, to move to the digital world, and it has been sort of, um, uh, it, it has always been a question to me, why does a publishing house like Handelsblatt Group take so long to actually come up with an interesting digital offering that people would be interested to read. Um, so uh, the key, uh, the journalists have to define their job in a new way. And uh, sort of what I've been seen o seeing over the past 20 years with many past, many former colleagues is that they are having a very hard time. Um, if you start uh, to write for a printed paper and uh, suddenly you're asked to sort of provide your content on various channels and at a very different speed, this is nothing that people adapt to easily. And in the beginning, in fact, we had the, the uh, experience in editing houses that you had to hire other people that would be able to, to deal with sort of online content and that would be able to, to sort of produce things at internet speed. Um, I think sort of many publishing houses have been trying to, to re-merge those groups, but it's been very difficult. Um, so, um, what does that mean now for, uh, if, if we are talking about the way people consume inf information, what does that mean for people who started in the old days and, in the old and, and sort of have been used to the old way of consuming and producing information? Basically, um, both Jochen and I have uh, <laughs> have moved to different places. Jochen is now in the online in the online world, and he will talk about this later. I moved to to the uh, to the uh, side of communications consultancy, which means what do we do as Herring Schuppener? Because I assume many of you haven't heard much about us in the past. We support companies in the way they distribute their information, and particularly in dis in situations that are difficult to explain, which in many cases our uh, clients have, have large transactions at the stock market that need to be explained, they have an M&A transaction that needs to be supported, or they have a large crisis, um, as for example in Wolfsburg at the moment. So um, there's lots of explanation that needs to be done these days. And what we advise our clients in is how do they distribute it? Because what, has, what does sort of the changed media environment mean for companies and for, for people who want to distribute information to various stakeholder groups? It means A, you have to be extremely fast. Let me give you an example. If we had, uh, for example, uh, a transaction that needed to be announced and uh, there was an, a mistake or a leak and sort of the information went out earlier than the company uh, wanted to announce it. So if we as, as sort of the communications advisor usually had half a day to correct it because sort of you hear about the information, you get a call from the journalist who says, oh, I heard company A wants to buy company B. What can you tell me about it? And then we would uh, sort of still have three, four, five hours in order to come up with a statement, correct it, verify it, whatever because we would have time until the evening news and time until sort of the newspaper would go to print in order to correct it. What happens nowadays is sort of the journalist calls you and says, I heard company A wants to buy company B. What can you tell us about it? You have 30 minutes to comment on it and otherwise he'll go online. And once he's online, sort of it will, it will go around the world in a minute. 
and what that means for capital markets transaction sort of can't be overestimated. It changes the scene dramatically. So we have to be extremely fast. We have to be extremely well prepared in order to be able to answer to those questions within 30 minutes because that's basically the time you get. What does that also mean for companies if they want to distribute information, if they want to inform the public? Um, the separation between content and channels means um, content uh, production is expensive. So the companies that pay for content, that pay people to produce content are usually under immense economic pressures. Magazines, papers are only one group of those. So there are less people who produce content uh, and get paid for it well in these days than there used to be. So that means for us, if we are talking about news within a special, uh, special sector, be it retail, be it automotive, be it banking, usually uh, within Germany, there's for each sector, there are three, four, five people who actually know the sector well and who understand what you actually want to talk to them about. And um, uh, so it's, it's there are very few people who have a great importance in order, in, in order to shape the way news gets distributed. There are a few key people, few key multipliers um, uh, that set the tone and you have to talk to them very early in order to make sure they understand what's actually happening. Um, so a few content producers, if you want to say this, have become extremely important. In earlier days, 10 years ago, there were 10, 15 people uh, with one issue that you could address, and now it's three to five at best. And if you're talking about a B2B sector that no one's basically interested, we talked about it earlier, if you talk about retail, you'll get lots of people interested. If we, uh, t we talk about B2B, building and construction industry, automotive suppliers, chemical industry, um, there aren't that many people out there who understand actually what Lanxess, for example, is doing these days. So, um, we need to take care of uh, those multipliers and at the same time there are many more stakeholder groups out there who have the opportunity to raise their voices very quickly and within seconds. There are um, communities, bloggers, um, people uh, with, very, uh, with very diverse interests um, that can raise their voices and in earlier times you had an editing office that was sort of uh, the filter for news because all the information uh, that came into the world had to pass through those editing offices be it print or radio or TV and those were people whose job it was to filter those news and decide was it newsworthy to the rest of the world or not and that doesn't happen that much anymore so everyone can start a blog and inform the public about it and maybe you will get 10 billion interested viewers um, so we have to have a look at a much broader universe, um, which is a lot of work. So that means if you want to get information out, it takes more time, it takes more efforts, it takes more channels, and it takes a different type of language so that people understand. Uh, because if you want to communicate via Twitter, and uh, if you're talking, in fact, about an M&A transaction, you have to think very hard how you really want to get sort of the es essence of the transaction into the digital world. Um, what does that mean for us, Herring Schuppener? And our job is, um, as I always say, is information brokerage. Um, what we do is we have, to, we have to expand into the digital world as well. I mean, nowadays, or, or these days, sort of most decision makers are 40 plus in terms of age. So they still read a paper from time to time, which helps us in our current setup. But we know uh, if we go forward 10 more years, um, those 40 plus uh, decision makers will probably not read that many papers anymore. Uh, so we will have to, to expand to the, uh, we will have to, to expand our business model and uh, open it up for all the new channels. So I don't know uh, how many of you saw it, but we have uh, just announced last weekend as uh, Herring Schuppmer that Andreas Wieniaski is joining us as a managing partner of our firm next year. 
and many of, of you will know him. Um, he's been the head of communications for Rocket Internet. He's been sort of spearheading their IPO communications and uh, is very well connected in Berlin. So we as a firm have decided, although we do very classical capital markets communications, we have to follow this uh, this uh, uh, development. So Andreas will uh, start our new digital entity within Herring Schipner, and I'm sure we don't know yet today how much this will change us. Thank you. <laughs>